All right, I'm gonna get to, uh, get to it here. We're gonna talk a little bit about what Ruby on the JVM is like and do kind of a retrospective of what brought me here and hopefully bring uh, some inspiration to all of you that nothing is impossible if you, uh, if you work hard enough. All right, so about me, uh, not actually came in from California, came from Minnesota, born and raised. Uh, nice central location to be able to get to all the conferences in the US. Uh, if you haven't been to the Minneapolis area, I recommend uh, visiting sometime. Uh, I've been developing since the mid-90s, uh, but programming pretty much as long as I can remember. Currently at Red Hat, which is technically IBM, but we're still really Red Hat. And uh, I've always had a lot of interest in both programming languages and, na and natural languages. Uh, before I realized there was such a thing as computer science, I almost went into linguistics. And so my work over the years with programming languages, my studies of natural languages have kind of gone hand in hand for most of my career. Uh, and one of, my, one of my earliest memories, one of the earliest things that really got me excited about technology was this movie. Who remembers this one? Woo! Yeah. The original uh, was not super popular at the time, but man, did it get its hooks in me. Uh, the idea of going inside the computer and seeing how everything works and controlling it and being an active participant in it was an early inspiration for me to get involved in computers, learn how to program, uh, and become a developer. Uh, I started out real early. Uh, I don't know if anybody had one of these devices. I had an Atari 400 as one of my earliest programming environments, uh, doing uh, just Atari Basic. Now, this is a MOS 6502, so real old processor here. And I swear that keyboard caused me more headaches than anything I've ever had in my entire programming career. I think it set me back years, <laughs> just desperately trying to push that membrane keyboard, listen for the beep each time I hit a key. Oh man, I wish I had an Atari 800 instead. Uh, but my dad uh, was the inspiration for a lot of this too. He knew that this was going to be very important to be able to know how to work with computers, program computers. He got an IBM PC XT. Uh, I was the first kid on the block that had a hard drive, a whole 10 megabytes. Oh man, I was copying games like mad. Later on, uh, in the uh, mid to late 80s, I, uh, my dad gave me a C programming book and I worked through it. Didn't have a whole lot of use for C programming at that time, but it was really kind of the second language that I learned, I did basic, and then I went straight to C. Uh, later on, C++, of course, uh, most of my C++ programming was before like templates, exceptions, it was like still a newish language at the time. And so like finding the compilers that supported all these new C++ features was tricky. And that's actually my original Turbo C++ box. I still have it. Uh, then I actually started building actual applications. Uh, like a lot of people, I started out with something simple. I knew basic, and so Visual Basic seemed like a good way to get going. Uh, I built the same application, a little Windows shareware utility called Hackett. Started out in Visual Basic, moved to Delphi, which is Object Pascal. Uh, almost took a developer as a Delphi, or a job as a Delphi developer at one point. Uh, and then I, then I moved on. I, I did more work in C++. I got to know Win32, ported my application again into C++. Uh, and then in the mid-90s, I finally uh, got an actual programming job when I went to the university. It was the weirdest, weirdest job I've had. I was a web server administrator for the business school and they ran all of their applications on an old Mac running AppleScript CGI. The weirdest combination of things. Uh, so moving to Perl was actually a nice breath of fresh air because it was actually a, a decent programming language and it could do a lot more than AppleScript could at the time. Uh, and then shortly after that, Java came out. That became the big new hotness, of course. And so I spent about a half a year at the university mostly writing like applets, like uh, GPA calculators, loan calculators, stuff like that. Uh, but it was a good introduction. It was nice to be there at the beginning with Java. So the thing I've learned from all of this programming since, since I was a kid is really just that, to remember, languages are tools. They're tools that you must learn well. Uh, a good developer can take any language and learn it and do a good job and build anything with it. You can build anything you want in any language. Uh, but the best languages are the ones that also encourage good developers. So it's always important to expand your horizons. Uh, you need to know your tools. Learn your language well. 
come to conferences like this, network with people that are experts in your tools, uh, be an apprentice, always be an apprentice, always be learning from others who've done more and who have seen more than you have. And you're always going to need more than one tool. So everybody wants to be able to just say, I'm an expert in this one language, I do everything in this one language, but you don't really. You've also got SQL, you've also got HTML and JavaScript. You have to know all these different tools. And the better you know them, the more cohesive and productive you'll be as a developer. All right, so shortly after that, rather, rather than the applets, which never really panned out, desktop Java never really became a big thing, uh, Java finally found its way towards the late 90s. Uh, before 1.3, Java was just too slow to be uh, desktop applications, to be scripting, to be CGI. Lots of people tried to plug Java into CGI back in the 90s, and of course that didn't work at all. Uh, it turned out that long-running server applications was really where Java found its real feet, found its direction. And this was also well-timed because it was right at the beginning of the web. People were building dynamic web applications. Uh, dot coms were popping up all over the place and Java went right along with them. So Java helped drive web development and web development helped Java evolve. Uh, so 96 to 98, 98, I was working at the University of Minnesota still uh, as a full-time employee now. We did a collaboration with IBM on what they called the student server. It was basically just a, a student uh, registration and management application, rather than going to the old 3270 terminals that we'd been screen scraping for years at the university, we built a whole new system on top of PeopleSoft. Uh, it predated most of the application server technology we have today. There were no standard Java web application servers, there was no JSPs. Uh, almost none of the stuff that we're used to now. JavaScript was just a toy for playing around inside a browser. Uh, this project also taught me how overcomplicated software can be. We had way too many layers. PeopleSoft was not the right tool for the job. And so we spent about three years working on this, never really completed it, and then IBM was on the hook to finish it. That was part of the deal. So yeah, keep your software under control or it's gonna end up becoming a major problem. Uh, and then beyond that, after working on that project, I moved on to other jobs. Uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, I was basically a Java web enterprise architect, uh, building Java 2E applications. Uh, I took on a couple of government contracts. So becoming an expert in Java, learning my tool well, and becoming the expert that was uh, in the room at any company. And that's when I, I stumbled into Ruby. So, what about Ruby here? So Ruby was born about the same time as Java, uh, wasn't really well known during most of the 90s except within Japan where it was created by Yukihiro Matsumoto. Uh, influenced heavily by Perl, Lisp, Smalltalk, Python had come out just a couple of years earlier so there's a little bit of that in there. Uh, but Mats had always been, Yukihiro Mats, we always call him Mats, uh, had also been a, a C and POSIX developer. So he wanted to, like Perl, like Python, to have a nicer language that wrapped up C, C, C code, C functions, and POSIX APIs, uh, and Ruby was his answer to that. Uh, it's heavily dynamic, so of course method calls are dynamic, but the fields that you have in an object are all dynamically determined at runtime. Constants are technically dynamic. They don't exist until they're assigned. They can be reassigned, it's not typical, uh, but they need to be dynamically looked up at runtime and then cached. Uh, the class structure, uh, there's not really any type declaration or class declaration in Ruby. You create a class object and then you stick methods into it, like a method table. Uh, so that's, that means you can add methods later, you can rewrite methods, you can delete methods, uh, you can make modifications to classes at runtime. Lots of interesting challenges for building a language. So it's kind of prettier than Perl, uh, a little less arcane than Lisp. Uh, inspired by both, but Mats has always said it was designed for happiness, for developer happiness, a language that you can feel comfortable and have fun writing in, but still be productive. So here's a little snippet of Ruby code. How many folks are Ruby developers or know some Ruby here? All right, so there's a few of us, about a third of the room maybe. So here's a little example in Ruby. Uh, we've got our greeter class. Initialize is basically the constructor. Uh, we take in a name variable, assign that to a name field in the object. All the fields are, are prefixed with an at sign. Uh, capitalize the name at the same time. 
Uh, notice not a lot of uh, syntactic ceremony here. We don't need parentheses for method calls. We don't need semicolons for end of line. Uh, the def and end is a little weird, but every language has its way of, of marking off blocks. Uh, we have a salute method that will just print out a little hello world line for us. Down at the bottom, we call new on the greeter class. New is just a method like any other. Creates the object and calls initialize on it. And then we call our method at the bottom. And now if we compare this to Java, there's not a whole lot that's really that different. We have more explicit visibility, we have public, we have more explicit types everywhere. Uh, we have the longest way of doing print to standard out uh, of any language that I've seen. Uh, but for the most part, this is pretty similar. You can make the transition from Java to Ruby and back pretty easily if you just understand a few keywords that are different. And so I, I came to Ruby and I found this and I, I, I started looking at the code and I'm like, you know, I could, I could learn this. I could write this code. Even as a Java developer, even not knowing any Ruby at all, I understood what was going on here. And it was not that hard to follow. So in 2004, I was working on that government contract out in DC. Uh, and uh, it turned out that RubyConf was going to be hosted in Reston, just outside of the DC area. And so it was my first Ruby conference. It was, I think, my first real conference attending uh, of any conferences. Uh, I saw uh, some major milestones like Koichi Sasada uh, introduced yet another Ruby VM, the new VM that would basically become the C implementation of Ruby. And to this day, that's the VM that we're running. Uh, hallway hacking at that conference basically produced all the begin all of the, the tools that Rubyists are used to now. Rake, Ruby Gems, the earliest build and packaging systems uh, all came out of discussions in the hallway track at RubyConf 2004. And there was a total of 65 people present. So it was the largest Ruby conference ever uh, with 65 people. And it was kind of, again, fun to be in on the ground floor of this. So also at RubyConf 2004 was the groundbreaking presentation where David Hansen came in and showed Rails for the first time. And this is really how Ruby found its way. Up until uh, the mid 2000s, uh, Ruby was kind of just a scripting language. It was used where Perl and Python were. There was a little bit of CGI use, a lot of uh, system scripting, uh, but it, you know, Python, Perl, those were still more popular. That was really their strong areas. Uh, in 2004, when Ruby on Rails was announced, suddenly it turned out that Ruby could be a really fun environment for building web applications. Uh, it only took about a year for this to pick up. Rails really took off, and it was everywhere. Uh, it changed how web development is done forever. Uh, the convention over configuration seemed like such a simple idea. You create an application, and all of the defaults are probably what you want to begin with. You don't have to configure everything in your application every time you build it. Uh, lots of other principles in Rails that made quick development, fast deployment, fast generation of code. Uh, you can build an entire app in just a few commands. So other frameworks started to pay attention, of course. And I was also inspired by what I saw at RubyConf. I was inspired by Rails. And so I'm sitting there. I'm wondering, I'm a Java guy. Can I use Ruby somehow? Can I work with this language? I'm, I'm curious. I want to be part of this new community. Uh, at that point, of course, I was fully committed to the, the Java ecosystem. Uh, things were really starting to pick up. We had JITs in place that were starting to speed up Java and make it competitive with native languages. Uh, the corpus of libraries and tools and frameworks that were out there was enormous, probably one of the best of, the la of languages at the time. Uh, better GC, better memory management. The whole platform was just moving forward so quickly. I wasn't going to be leaving that. And I really wanted to stay in the JVM Java world. So what if we could come up with some sort of a JRuby sort of thing? Like just build a Ruby on top of the JVM and still have the benefits of the platform with this fun new language. And of course, that's what we did. We, we didn't have a very creative name. We did just call it JRuby. Uh, but actually, that, I, I, there's a little bit of a rewind here. JRuby was reborn when I came to it. Uh, it was originally actually created in 2001, a few years before I got involved in the project. Uh, so er, long before Ruby was really an interesting language for large-scale development, this fellow, Jan, Ar Jan Arne Peterson, who we've never met, uh, started out by porting the Ruby parser. 
and then filling in the blanks, like add a couple of classes, add a couple of core features, and slowly having some simple scripting cases working with Ruby on the JVM. Uh, but by 2004, again, Ruby was still kind of just a scripting language. People didn't know what it was going to be good at. Uh, so there were only a few developers actively working on JRuby at the time. Uh, I looked it up, I looked for Ruby on the JVM, turned out there was a JRuby project, and amazingly, the most active developer on the project was Tom Anabo, who I had worked with at the university 10 years earlier. Weird happenstance that my old friend from university days turned out to be the person I'd work with for the next 15, 16 years. So, I wanted to get involved. I saw that there was a potential here. I saw the excitement in the room at RubyConf, and I wanted to start working on it. So I, I got in there and I started working on it. And this is really how JRuby found its way. So Rails sparked so much interest in Ruby. The idea of having Rails work on the JVM was incredibly exciting to people at the time. Uh, Java was trying to bring in new developers, Sun Microsystems was trying to expand the reach of Java and bring more languages to the platform. Uh, it's also, it was at that point, the plat one of the best platforms for doing web applications. And so Rails and the potential of the JVM clearly went together. The obvious path was for us to find a way to make JRuby on Rails happen. And I actually got permission from David Hansen to say JRuby on Rails. Uh, so JRuby on Rails became a real thing. Could we do this? Could we actually make Rails and the whole stack run on top of the JVM? And more importantly, should we do this? Is this, are we just polluting both worlds by combining these things? Uh, you know, it, the jury's still out on that one, we'll see. <laughs> so the road to Rails, what did it take to actually get us there? But almost nothing worked in Ruby, uh, running on JRuby in 2005. Even the most basic things were, were hardly functional. You could write some simple scripts, but most libraries didn't run. The language features and compatibility were just not there. Uh, so we started out with basic tools, and we filled in the blanks as we went. Uh, there were also very few compliance tests for Ruby itself. The largest suite of tests for the Ruby language were just a set of scripts that were written for the, the Ruby book by the authors, by the original Ruby programming language authors. Uh, so we ran those, we ran all of the libraries we could, we ran the tests that they provided, anything we could to get a handle on what Ruby was. Because up to now, the Ruby specification was basically just this big C code base that was CRuby. And we quickly ran into interesting challenges trying to adapt this posix -y C dynamic language to the JVM. Uh, but that's when it really started to get fun. All right, so I said we started, started out with simple tools here. So here is a, a little example of Ruby's interactive console, their REPL, basically. Uh, so this is the first thing we really wanted to get working. It would allow us to experiment with language features, test things out more quickly than running at the command line all the time. It was a logical first step. Plus, this forced us to fix a lot of language compatibility issues, build up a lot more of core classes, and things like eval behavior, being able to load code into a context at runtime and execute it uh, uh, from source in the program. Uh, there was also a lot of work here to get console behavior working. Uh, Java, even today, is not the greatest environment for building command line tools. The interactivity with the console is not great. Control over the TTY is practically non-existent. And we had to find ways to make this work. We found a read line wrapping library called JLine to get some of the line, line editing and line control. Uh, we had to find ways to route around the standard I.O. in Java because you can't do simple things like select on it. You can't do interactive I.O. very easily. And after all this work, one day in early 2006, we started up IRB, there were no errors, and we were actually able to run some code. It was very exciting, and it was one of the first things that really got us, uh, really showed us that there's potential here, that we can make this happen. We can at least get all of the weird edges of the language working. Let's see how far we can go with this. After that, we moved on to Rake and Ruby Gems. Uh, the tools started to solidify after RubyConf 2004 and 2005. Uh, they settled on Rake, is basically the Ruby make. Uh, as their main build tool. Then RubyGems became the winner as far as packaging systems. So Ruby 
libraries are packaged in a gem, push to rubygems.org, you do gem install locally, and, and so on. Uh, yes, yeah, so rake for the build tooling. This one required a lot of work on file system and file I.O. stuff. Uh, again, areas that Java was kind of weak on in the mid-90s. Uh, we had to find ways to make this stuff work. RubyGems also had a lot of requirements. We needed to be able to do network I.O. Uh, with the standard Ruby libraries, have a mapping, a binding to Java's socket that looked like Ruby's sockets. A big challenge since they're just like BSD socket API turned into Ruby code. We had to have a Zlib library to pack and unpack these archives. So that was a matter of wrapping Java Zlib support. We needed a YAML library, and there were no YAML libraries at the time for Java. Some of our developers were interested in trying to port this over, and so we had some of the first YAML libraries for the JVM as part of JRuby. Now, of course, this is JRuby. So the, important, the, the other important aspect of JRuby is being able to call from Ruby to Java and back again, integrating the two languages in a single platform. So the primary goal, of course, was to make Java classes and methods feel like they were just Ruby classes. So you could import them into an environment, construct new objects, and call methods as if it was just Ruby code. Ideally, so it should not look like you're writing in Java. The stretch goal was to also start being able to implement JRuby itself more in Ruby and just call into the Java libraries that we, we need. And a large portion of JRuby today is written in Ruby and just uses our Java integration to, to tie everything together. It works pretty well. Uh, I would say we've probably got the best Java integration of any dynamic language on the JVM. We've taken a lot of time and a lot of effort to make it feel like Ruby. So a Ruby developer can come in and start calling Java code and Java classes without really knowing anything about how Java works. You need to know a little bit about what you're passing as far as strings and numerics, uh, a little bit about some calling conventions, but ideally it looks like Ruby and people have been very impressed with, with how well masked it is when you pull Java into a Ruby environment. All right, so Ruby and Java integration, a little bit more on this. So each Java class essentially gets a mirror, a proxy Ruby class that represents all of the methods in that Java class. Now that what that gives us is that when you're in Ruby code, you can actually add methods to your Java classes too. They won't be seen by Java, of course, because it's statically compiled. They have to be there at boot time. But you can add Ruby niceties. You can add little Ruby short, shortcuts to Java classes, and they will show up for Ruby code. Um, you can also modify existing behavior so that when you call it from Ruby, it calls the Ruby logic, and then you redispatch back to the Java. So changing the API, make it easier to turn it into a Ruby-like, a Ruby-feeling API. Uh, all Java objects get wrapped in a, an iRuby object wrapper when they pass through JRuby. Uh, over the years, we've done various tricks to optimize this, but it, it, these days with uh, the JVM's memory management, it doesn't become much of a problem to have that wrapper object. Uh, we convert certain types going across that boundary automatically, so numerics and strings, kind of the core bones of communicating with uh, the Java language, uh, will automatically translate back and forth for their Ruby and Java equivalents. Uh, and then we, we used a lot of common idioms from Ruby and Java to, to make it feel a little bit more like Ruby. So the standard Java bean set foo, get foo, well in Ruby that's usually just an attribute. So we turned that into foo equals method or the foo method. Uh, we change, we add old methods in camel case in the, Ruby, the little Ruby proxy class, but we also add them all in the underscore case that Rubyists are used to. So if you want your code to just look like Ruby, it will. You don't have to call the camel case version and have it look so weird in your environment alongside other Ruby code. And then of course things like being able to implement interfaces, extend Java classes, various tricks over the years to improve this, but you can take any Ruby, any JVM API, find the interfaces that are necessary and implement them in Ruby. Pass that back. No one ever knows that you're calling Ruby code. It's just another object in the JVM. So this is a little interactive demo. Uh, I've learned over the years to record my demos, so this is, a, this is an older one. JRuby 9.4 is current, but this is all exactly the same now. So here, we're in our little environment. You can see we can access uh, Java classes in, the, in their packages using the standard .new convention for Ruby. So we create a frame, we create a button, and then we add the button to the frame and, and set it up so we can see it. 
And so then now you'll notice here set size was an underscore there. Uh, add action listener. Now here it takes an interface, but we're using Ruby's support for blocks, closures, to automatically implement that interface at the command at the the time that you call it. And so the body of that block becomes the implementation of the action listener, gets called when we push the button, and then then it works. So pretty easy. Uh, it looks like Ruby. You can write it in a Java style if you want, but again, we wanted that flexibility that you could go either way, Ruby-like code or Java-like code. All right, so putting all of this together. So in spring of 2006, we got enough of these libraries working, we got all the tools together, the interactive console was working. Uh, JRuby on Rails became reality. We routed our first request. Uh, Tom and I were sitting on campus at the university at one of our favorite coffee shops started up the server, hit it, got our first request, and oh man, was it slow. It was incredibly slow. It took like 30 seconds for it to route that first request. It got a little bit faster as we made other calls, and we're like, well, it works, but I don't know if this is what we want to sell to people. Thankfully, we started looking online and like, okay, my Rails application is slow. Maybe there's something out there that Rubyists know that we don't. And of course there was. We were actually in development mode. Um, and so it was reloading all of the code from your application every time you would hit the application. Clearly that's why it was slow. We flipped it into production mode and it worked amazingly. So we, we started blogging about this. We started uh, telling people in the community about what we were doing. Uh, and we went to Java 1 for the first time, the first, my, my first time presenting at Java 1 in 2006. Uh, we had one of the big rooms. We had about 1,500 people in just our room, I think. Jam-packed. Um, the, the room was completely full. That's how exciting the idea of Rails on the JVM was to the Java world at the time. And this is about when Sun Microsystems started to pay attention. They're like, hey, these guys actually managed to get this leading edge Ruby framework, which I don't think is even a 1.0 by at this time. It was like a 0.9 something at that point. They really wanted to bring us on board, give us the resources we needed to keep this going. And that meant we started full-time work on JRuby in 2006. And that's what I've been doing since then. So they really started this whole thing for me and, and changed my whole life. All right, so moving on. Uh, we certainly weren't done at this point. Uh, we needed performance to be much better. We needed to be ideally faster than the standard runtime. We needed all of our Java integration to be quick and, and work well with all JVMs. And wait, there we go. Uh, so there were things like strings and IO handling we had to fix. Uh, all the dynamic stuff. We were doing it just the dumbest way possible. Go to a method table, look it up, call it every single time. Clearly not the fastest way to do it. Uh, there was also a heavy dependency on native libraries in the Ruby world. It grew up in C and POSIX, and the standard way to expand Ruby's capabilities was to write a C extension, which at the time was basically just a raw API into the internals of Ruby. So one by one, we had to basically re-implement key parts of Java to get full Ruby compatibility. One of the first big ones, that we ran into was regular expression problems uh, using the JVM's built-in regular expressions. Uh, it turns out that the way it's designed, it recurses for certain forms of regular expressions like uh, alternations, like I show here, A star or B star. Actually, I think this should be A, A B star. But uh, this wasn't a problem for typical Java applications that were just matching short snippets of text. But there, were co there was code in Rails that actually used regular expressions to parse image binaries. So we're taking a regular expression that has, that's huge to begin with, because it knows where all the bits of the object, of the image header and so on are supposed to be, and feeding it maybe a few megabytes of content to match against. If there's any of these alternations in there, boom, stack blows out, couldn't work it. So that had to be fixed. So we tried a bunch of different other regular expression engines. JRegex worked pretty well. Uh, and then eventually we would port the C regular expression engine that CRuby uses. So this is what that looks like. Very simple to, uh, to do it here. I'm just using JRuby with Java integration to demonstrate it. So we do pattern.matches. We feed it a very simple alternation regular expression here, but a bunch of content can't even handle it. It just blows right up. Uh, and we ran into this as we started testing different features of Rails, it turned out that the regular expression engine in the Java was just not going to do it. 
So that library we ported, it's called Joni. It's out there and it's available for, for anyone to use today. Uh, it's short for Java Onigaruma. Onigaruma was the C-based regular expression engine that Ruby moved to. And amazingly, we keep finding these community contributors that are willing to port huge C code bases for us. Uh, so this Marcin Mielzinski, he ported it to Java for us. So this is a bytecode based register machine, so it's not going to deepen the stack. It actually has its own little bytecode engine that runs inside of it. Uh, it matches on byte array, and that'll become important later, I'll, I'll show you why. But there is a port that was used by the NAS Horn uh, JavaScript implementation to just use characters in Java. Uh, you can have different character encodings. So a regular expression engine that is not tied to a particular encoding like UTF-8. It can be ASCII, it can be SHIFT-GIS, it can be any of the European ISO encodings, but still use the same engine. Uh, and there's where you can get some more information about it. So now the next big one. Uh, in Ruby, a string is not really just a string. It is uh, an array of bytes and an encoding. And this means that you can have lots of strings in the system with different encodings. It means that binary is actually considered one of the encodings. So we needed to be able to handle strings that essentially were just backed up by a raw byte array and, and a separate descriptor to say what encoding those bytes were in. Uh, this was not possible to do with Java Lang string, of course. Uh, this Java string is UTF-16 always. We could not represent other encodings in it really could not represent binary content in it. So we were forced to implement our own string and encoding logic for JRuby. So now we've replaced regular expressions and strings and character encodings from Java with ones that work with Ruby. So another library came out of this, it's called jcodings. Uh, this is again a port of the CRuby logic for handling different character encodings and translating from one to another. Uh, there's a few di dozen different encodings, all of the Unicode encodings, all of the ISO encodings, Japanese uh, CJK, the Chinese, Japanese, Korean encodings, uh, and several other weird ones. Uh, I have not ported EBCDIC yet, and I think we have a bug report. Who knows what EBCDIC is? Yeah, <laughs> that dates us a little bit. Look it up. It's a, it's a very interesting and weird character encoding by IBM based on what punch cards looked like, essentially. Uh, so there's where their jcodings is, but we wrote our own character encoding system and ported over their whole character uh, uh, encoding translation backend from CRuby. We also needed things like to get secure sockets working if we we're going to be hosting applications in JRuby. Uh, and the way CRuby did this was with a very thin wrapper around OpenSSL. It's almost just the OpenSSL API translated into Ruby. Now, of course, we didn't have a direct OpenSSL on the JVM, so another developer on our team, Olabini, who you might have heard of, is uh, he, he did this amazing work basically writing an OpenSSL for the JVM that we then wrapped with some Ruby code and had our SSL layer. Uh, it's still in use today. It is a huge code base, and we really need some help updating or moving on to one of the other OpenSSL bindings. So there's a, there's a call to action for you. And then, of course, I mentioned the native library thing. Uh, we really needed to be able to work with native libraries, but supporting this invasive C extension API was just not, not going to fly. Uh, we have JNI, but that boundary is very expensive to cross. Uh, the C extension API had access to all sorts of CRuby VM internals. Uh, it just didn't make any sense. So we led the way in the Ruby world with a more programmatic approach. First of all, introducing the Java native runtime. Uh, some of you may know JNA, uh, Java Native Access. JNR is our version of that designed more around what we needed for JRuby. Uh, it's a set of libraries for pulling in C libraries, binding them to Java functions, and then calling them. Uh, you can look at it on GitHub at JNR. Uh, in addition to just being able to load and call those libraries, we've pre-bound some things like POSIX, Unix sockets, uh, native I.O. So you can pull in those libraries and do native Unix socket stuff on JRuby or on the JVM today. Uh, later on, we ported a Ruby API called FFI uh, from another implementation, Rubinius. And that has become the standard way that Ruby folks write Ruby code to wrap C libraries now. 
Uh, we encourage people to avoid using C extensions since they are so invasive and other, language, other implementations can't use them. So FFI kind of became the thing. So this is an example of Ruby FFI. Uh, here we're, we're using the get time of day function from libc. We define a struct object by extending FFI struct, the time val structure here. Uh, we tell it what fields we have and what the sizes are, so it knows where they're aligned in memory. Then down on libc module here, we create a module. We extend FFI library, so the FFI knows that this is going to be for wrapping C code. We tell it what library we want, and there's some constants in here for standard libraries. And then tell it what the function is and what the types for in and out are. Down at the bottom, we can create a new instance of the structure. We can call it with the function, and it all just goes right out to C. It comes back into Ruby, and we've got our answer. Now, interestingly, this also became exciting for the Java world over the past 10 or so years. Uh, and I wrote one of the original uh, JEPs, JDK enhancement proposals, to add a native foreign function API to the JVM. I believed it's something that had to be built in. Uh, .NET had its uh, but P invoke or native invoke form that you could do. We had nothing of the sort. Everybody was forced to go through JNI. And finally, we are now starting to see this support in Project Panama. Uh, not only is it just a foreign function API that can call C, it also knows about the JIT, it knows about optimizations, and can reduce some of that overhead we'd see with JNI. There's also a foreign memory API, so you can work with foreign blocks of memory in, in the application, and it will optimize all of those calls, rather than, again, going down into JNI and back for what's simply a memory access. And probably the coolest part, it comes with a tool that you can point at any header file, and it will generate the Java bindings for it. Uh, even can do this at runtime. So you deploy an application, you point it at a header file at runtime, it loads all the Java code and API into memory, and you can start calling it immediately. Uh, this is a quick little demonstration from the uh, J-Extract uh, Panama GitHub repository. Uh, so here, this is a little bit of C code defining a point 2D structure and a distance calculation. We pass that to the j extract command, and this is going on the command line, but as I mentioned, you can generate class files, you can generate bytecode at runtime and just pull it in without dumping anything to the file system. And that's going to output uh, Java code that looks sort of like this. We import our j extract point, point h, we in, in, import our point 2d, and then using somewhat arcane syntax here, we can create a new memory segment for this stru structure. We can populate it with some values and call our function directly. So all of this done automatically, even though it's a little weird looking, it's amazing to see this on the JVM, that we can now actually just pull in C libraries and start calling them with good performance. So now, as far as performance goes, we also wanted JRuby to be fast. We wanted to at least be faster than the standard C implementation, which was not known at the time for its speed. Uh, but ideally, we wanted to be as fast as any other JVM language. And the only way we were going to do that was to have some sort of compiler to turn Ruby into JVM bytecode. So the interpreter worked well, but it was just way too slow. It was similar in performance to the C implementation, uh, but it was not taking advantage of what the JVM had available to it. So in 2007 to 2008, I started working on what I think is the first ever bytecode JIT on the JVM. We lazily would translate Ruby code into bytecode as needed, uh, similar to how the JVM takes Java code and lazily translates it into native code. Uh, that also technically makes this the first native JIT for Ruby. We didn't write any of the native JIT code, but by turning it into JVM bytecode, we get all of the advantage of the JVM JIT and optimizations. So after a few calls, I think we use 50 calls right now, uh, we translate the code into bytecode, dump it into the JVM, and then it picks it up and optimizes it into native code. So we're really, we're really pushing on the JVM in all these directions, re-implementing these core libraries, doing native calls. We needed the JVM to catch up with us, technically. Uh, so more and more of JRuby is leaving all of these standard Java features behind. The string, the regular expression stuff, we have our new I.O. layer, we start using native I.O. rather than the N.I.O. library. Uh, 
bytecode JIT being a, a very new idea. And so in 2007, we were working at Sun Microsystems, and the JVM folks wanted to talk to us about something called Invoke Dynamic. This has been an idea that they wanted to do in the JVM world for many years, and they, they wanted a way that dynamic languages could hook into the optimization of the JVM uh, without requiring them to do a lot of extra work, without a lot of extra optimization or code generation. And that's where Invoke Dynamic came from. It added a bytecode to the JVM uh, for the first time in a long time, and I don't think we've added any since even, and uh, a set of APIs that basically let you use method pointers, pass them around, bind them into call sites in such a way that the JVM's JIT optimizations could pick that up, inline the code, and make it run as fast as regular Java. So we integrated this immediately. Uh, Olabini was our uh, proxy on the Invoke Dynamic Steering Committee and made sure that all of the features that were coming out of Invoke Dynamic were going to work for the Ruby language. Uh, we integrated this actually well before it was in a release, so the API was even changing at that point. But we helped prove this technology could make root languages like Ruby faster. How much faster? Well. This is a little chart with two, two benchmarks. One is a Mandelbrot generator. The other one is just a red-black tree. Just creates a bunch of nodes, walks them, searches them, and, and tears it down again. So uh, here's an example uh, comparing with JRuby without Invoke Dynamic. The Mandelbrot generation on Java 8 was almost two times faster. And we've continued to see this improve over time. So this is Java 11, nearly four times faster. Uh, and here, Java 17, even still seeing improvements in Invoke Dynamic optimization. Red Black Tree, oh, and, and interesting to note, this is now we're well over the CRuby standard speed. This is actually comparing with current CRuby and their new native JIT. We're still several times faster. Uh, the red black tree doesn't get as much change over time, but still running in the three to four times uh, faster than the C implementation using their JIT. So it is really working. I, can, I look at assembly code and I can see that it's optimizing this stuff right. And there we go, about two times faster on that one. Again, walking object graphs, there shouldn't be a whole lot of extra overhead, but still Invoke Dynamic helps quite a bit. Now, because we're on the JVM, we get to take advantage of a lot of these other technologies, like the Graal JIT, which is fairly new. Uh, so here's an example with uh, JRuby again. We throw Graal JIT at this, which has incredible support for eliminating all of our numeric objects, numeric boxes. Uh, now we're talking 15 times faster by changing nothing in JRuby uh, just by running a different JIT compiler, moving to a different JVM, basically. Uh, this is very exciting. You might ask why we don't just tell people to use Graal all the time, and that's because of issues like this. Uh, it can be way faster for things where it can eliminate a lot of objects that the standard uh, JVM JIT can't, but it still sometimes is not as fast. So it's a, a bit of a mixed bag, and we recommend people try stuff out. Okay. So a little bit later, uh, we had this JIT, we had things working, and Vuck Dynamic was hooked up, but it was clear that just doing our translation from an AST into bytecode was not really the best way to compile things. I had to do a lot of hand optimization of the bytecode as I went through the AST. I had to do a lot of the little peephole optimizations and dead code sort of analysis. So it was better for us to do a new compiler design, really. Uh, and again, we found somebody in the community that was a, a former optimizing compiler designer, uh, background in C++, writing JIT compilers. He helped us write a, a new compiler for JRuby that was more of a, a standard compiler design, like the Dragon Book, if you've ever heard of that. Pretty much compilers 101 is the way this works. And it's the one we have in, our, in JRuby today. We call it IR. It's our new intermediate representation. Uh, so it's got basic blocks, operands, control and data flow. We can do dead code analysis. We can fold constants in. We can reduce accesses to local variables and fields. All the stuff that we'd expect out of a compiler and that I had trouble doing with just a simple AST translation. So the bytecode JIT got a lot simpler because IR did most of the work of compressing the code down and getting rid of the pieces that we didn't need. Another problem that we ran into on the JVM, uh, around the time that they introduced that YARV, uh, yet another Ruby VM, was the need for virtual threads. So in 2007, Ruby introduced the concept of a fiber. 
Now, a fiber is basically like a little threadlet, a virtual thread that runs within a native thread. So a single native thread might drive several fibers. They look like they're threads. They look like they're their own separate thread running, but you switch back and forth between them explicitly. I'm, I can't do any more work right now. I'll pass off control to a different fiber on the same native thread. So you could potentially have thousands of these little micro threads in a typical application. And of course, without any sort of concept of fibers or virtual threads on the JVM, we just had to wrap native threads so that they could each in run independently. Uh, this, was, this is big and heavy and slow, but the worst part is that when we start to get beyond 1,000 fibers or so, it doesn't work. We just can't run that many. Uh, a little bit more graphical example of how virtual threads work. So, we got execution flow here. Uh, starting at the top on this side, we've got just a standard threaded web request handler, okay? So thread one, uh, it accepts a socket, it waits for some IO, and then it has to sit there. So now this thread is basically just descheduled. It's not doing any work for us. It's sitting there waiting on IO. Could be doing some work, but it's waiting. Now, later on, finally, the request comes in on that IO stream. Uh, we handle the request, we get our response ready, we send that to the client, but then we also kind of got to wait and make sure that they got the response, we've got to wait for the network, so we're descheduled again. If we look at this in terms of virtual threads or fibers, you can see the advantage here. Instead of doing all the work within the thread itself, we start a fiber up or a virtual thread. The virtual thread accepts the socket, it waits on I.O., and at that point, we can see this native thread is going to be sitting there doing nothing. Well, why don't we start another fiber up? We can switch the thread over to this other fiber, this other virtual thread, accept a socket, wait on I.O. OK, well, now the first fiber is ready. Let's go back to that. We can handle this request. We can send a response, and so on. So a single thread can do multiple threads worth of work in, in parallel. Uh, here's an example of just starting up a bunch of Ruby fibers. Uh, this is not typical code for Ruby, but when you start handling requests and dealing with a bunch of different incoming sockets, we can get into the neighborhood of thousands, tens of thousands of fibers, potentially. So we uh, are going to benchmark this here. We're running in a loop five times. Uh, we're going to get the current time, and then a thousand times, and then map that into a hundred thousand or a hundred thousand times turns into 100,000 fibers. So we spin up 100,000 fibers. They're sitting there waiting for us to start them up. And then it, one by one, we start them and let them run to completion and see how long that takes. And of course, we run this with a regular native thread as each fiber, and boom, of course, it crashes. The JVM can't handle this. I mean, 1,000 a thousand threads is bad enough. 10,000 is where it completely starts to fall apart if your operating system will even let you get that far. And so we can't run stuff like this. Very unhappy with this. And we've had people start to report this more over the years. Now, the exciting part is, again, the JVM is catching up with us. Uh, Project Loom is going to bring virtual threads to the JVM as a native concept, a fast concept, so you can do this sort of virtual threading, fiber-based development uh, on the JVM. So it's a user mode threading, essentially. You hand off control to these little virtual threads explicitly. Uh, the JVM handles scheduling all this stuff so that whatever needs to run is running at that time. Uh, and the thread doesn't have to pause. You can pass it off to another virtual thread and keep working. And it's a perfect analog for Ruby Fiber, of course. Uh, this is a preview available in Java 19 and 20. Uh, in Java 21, I believe it will be a final API on the JVM. The JVM will actually have virtual threads as a standard feature. So, of course, I wanted to jump right in on this. So once they started to have working builds around the Java 19 time, uh, I decided to jump in and see what I could do, see, you know, get the hard work done of implementing Ruby's fibers on top of virtual threads. And about five minutes later, uh, I was done. Here is where we used to call out to a fiber executor, basically a thread pool, uh, so we're at least avoiding creating new threads when we don't need to. All I did was translate that into an th a thread dot of virtual dot start, pass it a block of code that's going to run within that virtual thread, and it's done. I take the same benchmark with that one line of code change, 
and it works. It runs, and it runs really well. This is 100,000 virtual threads starting up and executing to completion. So very exciting when that worked the first time. I'm looking forward to this being in uh, Java 21 for sure. OK, so JRuby today, where are we now? Uh, so we've had production deployments over the years. There's thousands of apps out there doing all sorts of things. Of course, there's a lot of web, but we've got desktop applications. There's people doing mobile development. There's point of sale stuff, uh, critical industries like finance and medicine. Uh, there's actually an application that runs the Oslo airport refueling console that they use for all of the airplanes. That is a JRuby Android application. That's a terrifying use of your project there. <laughs> Every time I fly through Oslo, I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> this, this, don't let this not be the day that JRuby crashes. Uh, and it's really, it's industry leading as far as alternative Ruby implementations. The only Ruby implementation that's ever seen wide scale development use. Uh, so JRuby on Rails, this is the big thing that really brought us out. Uh, it's really simple. You just generate an application, populate the database, and deploy it. But of course, on JRuby, you get all of the benefits of the JVM. Concurrent threads, better garbage collectors, deploy on any Java environment. Uh, so let's get started with that. JRuby install, very simple. Install a JDK, which you probably already have or can easily get. Uh, we have recommendations for minimums, but pretty much any JVM will work. Install JRuby, which can be the tarball. You can pull it from Maven. We've got uh, installers for the different Ruby language switchers, Ruby implementation switchers. We gem install Rails here, and that will go install all of the dependencies that are needed for the base Rails commands. Rails new creates a new application, generates a bunch of files for you and a whole framework, a scaffold for your application. We can continue with the scaffolding metaphor and scaffold out a blog post. So here we are creating a blog post that's going to have a string title, a body that's text, and a Boolean published field. Uh, I think there's also some dates and other stuff in there. It generates all of the controller logic for you. It generates some basic views. We set up the database, and it comes with built-in support for SQLite, MySQL, and Postgres. It'll use SQLite by default. Again, another library we had to wrap that's native. We Generate, generate and migrate the database. We start up the server, and we've got it. We've got JRuby on Rails running on the JVM. Amazing. So excited when we were able to first see this. And of course, we have actually got a fully working application now. We can enter blog posts in, we can view them, we can edit them, we can delete them. Not the greatest user experience on this, but you've got a working application. You can see why startups still today use things like Rails to get applications going. Now, in addition to JRuby on Rails, of course, we can do things like JRuby on Android. Uh, there is a little toy out there called Rubato. It's essentially a Ruby REPL for Android. Uh, Rubato is being used on uh, that terminal system, that refueling terminal in uh, Oslo, for example. There are other commercial applications that are out there. Um, it's been neglected a bit, but we're updating it for 90, JRuby 9.4 now. Here is an example of the Rubato IRB console. So we're just on a phone here, but we can enter in Ruby code and play around with the Android APIs live. Uh, it also comes with an editor and some pre-written scripts for demonstrating various aspects of Rubato and Android. Uh, if you want to give this a try, unfortunately, ha it turns out that having an interactive programming console where you can pull any code you want is not really a secure thing on Android. And so they pulled it. it. It just asked for too many permissions. It tried to do too much code magic at runtime. Uh, we're going to republish this soon. But for now, you can find the APKs out there on the various search sites. There's two projects you need, Rubato Core, which is where JRuby comes in, and then Rubato IRB, which is the little smaller application written in Ruby. OK. So where are we now with the future of Ruby, the future of JRuby here? So compatibility and performance are really solid right now. We are almost completely caught up with the, the Ruby language uh, compatibility level. They're on 3.2. We just got a release out last year with 3.1. Uh, performance is looking good, always more to do. And there are other challenges that still remain, of course. There's still work to do. There's still more for me to experiment and for you to contribute to. 
So one of the big areas, startup time and warm up. This is the number one complaint from Ruby users. Uh, standard Ruby is kind of designed to start up very quickly and get going immediately at the command line. Uh, that's not what the JVM is known for, surprisingly. So we're still working on ways around that. Uh, things like preloaders can help. We're looking at some of the native AOT options like GraalVM. Uh, but take a look at Project Crack, which allows you to save a JVM image and then launch into it immediately. It basically saves the process image and then starts it right up. And Project Leiden, which is also a new effort to bring standardized, ahead of time native compilation to Java. Memory usage is always a challenge comparing with CRuby. They are very, they've refined the size of their objects down very small. Uh, and the JVM is just really big. So even a simple object is 16 bytes wide before you even start putting any fields in it. Uh, project Lilliput is the OpenJDK project that's going to try and shrink that down at least, at least halfway to 64 bytes so we don't have so much extra object overhead on the JVM. Uh, and then, of course, new GCs have been amazing. Seeing the JVM actually give memory back to the operating system that it doesn't need is, a, is just a new thing for me. Uh, usually, you set a big old size, and it stays there forever. So the number one challenge here, maintaining JRuby itself. Uh, Ruby is a very big world. JRuby is a very big project. And there are really, there's only two of us, Tom and I, that work on this project full time today. Uh, we got maybe six to 12 regular contributors that pop in you know, once a week. We get a few pull requests from these people. But we need more help. Uh, we, are, we will fall again, behind again on compatibility. We work on user issues. We work on performance. We don't get compatibility done. We work on compatibility. We can't do user issues and performance. So we need more folks, more hands on. Uh, and optimization has kind of been on hold while we were catching up. So here's your, here's your last call to action here, help wanted. Seeking new developers to improve JRuby. Applicants must have knowledge of parsers, compilers, bytecode generation, regular expressions, string encodings, cryptography, uh, virtual threading, kind of new, but we'd like that. That's a, that's a nice to have. Uh, native interop, memory profiling, code optimization, Ruby, and Java, and how the JVM works. Or we'll teach you whatever you want to know. <laughs> If you want, if there's one of these areas that sounds interesting to you, just come talk to me. I've had to do all of this, so we'll get there. And we really, we really need you. We, we need folks like you to get involved. It's a lot of fun. I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. So here's, here's my wrapping up, OK? My journey to Ruby has been really fun and exciting. I came all the way from Atari Basic uh, through C and C++ and Java to essentially writing a Ruby VM on top of the JVM. Uh, we've created dozens of innovations for the JVM, and the JVM itself has grown to support languages like JRuby. And we work very closely with all of the J JVM teams around the world. Maybe the most important point here, I didn't know how to do any of this in 2004 when I got involved in JRuby. I learned how parsers work. I learned how compilers work. I learned all of the native stuff that had to be dealt with. And you can too. And I'll help teach you, and the team will help teach you, but we really would love to bring you in and show you a new way of, of thinking about the programming on, on the Java platform. Uh, so with persistence and curiosity, nothing is impossible. Of course, that's hyperbole, but on the Java platform, I believe it. We've made this happen. We really have made miracles happen, bringing such a weird external language to the JVM. So you know, why not give it a try? Try JRuby out. Let me know if you've got some free cycles to help contribute, and I'm sure we can route you towards something. So thank you very much.